Welcome back to Girls Talk Comics. It's your master mediocrity, Aaron. Oh, fuck, that's a fucking clap. Yeah. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Fucking clap. Welcome back to Girls Talk Comics. It's the master of mediocrity, Aaron. And the lieutenant of literature. It's Jessica. Barely, barely hanging on. Same. It's almost dinner. Yo. Time, so. Oh my god, I'm so hungry now. Why did you say that to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get through this one with uh, maybe a little bit of haste, but definitely not going to leave out any important details. We are talking about Bitch Planet today. There's no haste in this. This is just, this is life. Bitch Planet. I don't even know where to start. I'm just going to read the back of the book. It's an image title. It is done by Kelly Sue DeConnick and Valentine Delandro. Sorry if I butchered those names. I did not practice. On the back of this book, <laughs> it says, Are you non-compliant? Do you fit in your box? Are you too fat, too thin, too loud, too shy, too religious, too secular? Too prudish, too sexual, too queer, too black, too brown, too whatever it is they'll judge you for today. You just may belong on Bitch Planet. Bitch Planet is a prison. The only people who are there, women. These are women who've been thrown away by their family. Simply don't fit into whatever box the culture wants them to fit in. They're thrown onto this planet where it becomes kind of like incredibly violent. It's terrifying. But in Bitch Planet, they're pretty much, as a way to make more money, they're going to take a team of these girls and have them play some professional sport against men's teams. They get that started in book one, so I, I'm not going to even make any idea of where it goes from there. But the idea, at least, is that they're going to get their asses kicked and potentially killed on camera for entertainment by male athletes in this sport. That's just the fucking tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I think the first issue, we could talk a little bit about the first issue without giving too much away. Unfortunately, this is a property that didn't go nearly as long as everyone was hoping it would. It kind of like guttered out due to repeated issues getting to deadlines and just all sorts of reasons. They put so much work into every single issue of this. Each one. If you can get the single copies of these, these single issues, I'm going to jump ahead to that. The single issues have so much back content that is amazing. Every once in a while, comics come around that have full-on experiences built into them. So I'd say, like, Wicked and Divine is one. It was one that centers on, like, Japanese demon culture that has the same sort of situation where they put back matter in. And Bitch Planet, it was a statement piece by Deconic and the rest of the artistic team. And Yeah, I heard that Deconic say that it was supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> well... They 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 gave you a little bit of comedy in the way that the back of the book happens. Because the back of the book is like a bunch of ads. And the ads are like, you either laugh or you're going to cry about it. Like at one point, they try to sell you a stomach worm, mm -hmm. an intestinal tract worm to lose weight. I agree, X was you know, the one that really um, stuck with me. Yeah. yeah, But um, the first issue, I think, is going to give you <laughs> the best idea of sort of the tone of the entire series as it, you know, stands. I mean, hopefully, in some perfect world, we'll get the rest of it. But for now, as it stands, that first comic has this wonderful bait and switch where you don't know who the protagonist is until the final panels, basically. Yeah. This feeds into a little bit of what you want to talk about. Like, it centers around this white, middle-aged woman and her husband talking about how there's been some mistake <laughs> about yeah. how she ended up there. She's innocent, blah, blah, blah. And you have sort of this, the Greek chorus in the background with a couple of technicians. Like, they do, they do a lot of really interesting literary framing devices. You have hollow vids, you have flashbacks, you have, like I said, the Greek chorus and framing devices that kind of lead you to a conclusion. That conclusion is that she's the protagonist, and this is going to be a story about escaping Bitch Planet, but actually <laughs> the story is about this other woman who is not a white middle-aged woman. She's a younger african-american i assume who is like an ex-professional sports player woman of like, color yeah woman of color it's amazing because most of the faces you see in this sort of speak to that kind of intersectionality in feminism and i think it's really wonderful that 
is kind of built into this property because I, I don't know, but I think Deconic is actually not a woman of color. So the fact that she had so many other voices in there to help bring that up. Yeah. So we've, we've talked about this before where like, like in a different episode, you say like, if you try to write about, you know, like race issues and stuff, you lose a lot of nuance. And I, so I think that that kind of speaks to the extended creative team that they had mm-hmm. involved in this that so, you didn't have yeah. that happen. You know, let's talk about that nuance. I think interesting about this book is that there are people who are villains, but the villain at the whole is society. They are fighting against yes. what culturally is expected to be perfect and compliant. That said, a lot of the characters who we are following as victims and excluded from this are not white women. A lot of them do present as black, some Asian, there are some white women, and and I believe there might be one woman with a with a learning disability or a genetically based diagnosis. There's also a lot of these women are queer in some capacity. So when they're showing the origins for one of the women, instead of Kelly trying to have the conversation using the character's words about race, what they have is her listening to society's words about race, which is a an important distinction in my opinion. Because instead of Kelly being like, well, what would a black woman say about race and responding to race? Instead, they're having racist white men (laughs) say shit about race around her and then her reacting to it, which I think is important for her to do as a white or at least a white presenting storyteller, because she's not trying to replicate the conversation that a conversation she's never been a part of, you know, like she's doing it from the perspective or she's mm-hmm. presenting the perspective of other white people, which is, I don't know how to say it. Like, that is the story that she may have grown up with more so. You know, like being a white woman, you're exposed to that. Like, I, I can tell, I'll be honest, in my experience in growing up as a white woman, a lot of people have said just horrible shit around me because they also know I'm white. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> like, why would you ever think to say that, let alone to me, a yeah, stranger? Same, same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been exposed to that rhetoric and that ideology. She has too. I can repeat that ideology more so than I can repeat any conversation that a person of color would have about race because I wasn't exposed to those conversations growing up. Those weren't conversations weren't around me. What the conversations that were relevant to me are this is the racist ideology that people spout. It's not your belief. So I, I appreciate her taking that perspective. But another part about it where they went above and beyond that I thought was really great and really is sitting with me as a reader of it is that all of, I mean, the personification of the villains are all men, mostly white men, but it's how white women are also the villains in the story. Certainly today, and it, I was reading an interview between her and somebody who's like, so did you expect for this to be so relevant? She's like, well, when I wrote it, it was supposed to be satire, but then Trump happened. <laughs> so it was like, oh, yeah. yeah, it became less funny and more like, oh, God, these are real conversations. I mean, not sending people to space prisons, but, you know, a lot of people, certainly when Trump was elected, were talking about how white women are villains equally as much as white men because they were voting for Trump too. And and historically, they've been equally involved with the dehumanization of the yeah. people who don't fit in the boxes as white men were. People can argue all they yeah. want about their own survival and conformity. Implicit. The, yeah. The fact of the matter is, I mean, there every once in a while you do see other women who weren't white who are also conforming to greater society. But the the book makes it very, very clear that the pretty people that they want are other white women, which is still reflective of, like, I mean, it's satire. It's it's reflective of society, like, as a whole on 2020. I don't like saying that because I would love to have the perfect world where everyone is just loved and celebrated for who they are, but I'm also not a fucking idiot. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I I think that it's, I think that it's really interesting because I don't I don't know that I heard that it was supposed to be satire originally because I I think that it would have gone over better if it was played more into satire I think that there would have been better responses from people who aren't as viscerally affected by the themes of this graphic novel comic book series yeah because it's easier to palletize if you are implicit in the structure of the bad thing if you're reading it as satire than it is if you're reading it straight. And I know there was a lot of really negative reactions to this because of how serious it took things. 
but I don't know how they could have kept talking about it in such like the scope that they oh, took. Oh yeah, with it. I don't know how they could have kept it light. <laughs> so to quote the interview, I mean, one of her lines was. Valentine and I were trying to walk a line between something that we thought was ridiculous but also plausible. The two touchstones we have are The Handmaid's Tale and RoboCop. So we wanted the kind of plausibility of Handmaid's Tale, which is, to kind of paraphrase, which is chilling because it is so plausible. So it's, they definitely, I think, they took theme that isn't present, the sci-fi, futuristic, space prison stuff, but really laid it on thick with the very real discrimination that's happening and you know this we could talk about man eaters again with this like man eaters is yeah. very obviously satirical because it, the absurdity is a little bit and the comedy is a little bit more visible like the art's simpler the backgrounds are simpler the ads i think stick out a little bit more like they're a bit funnier in a in a way um mm-hmm. but man eaters also fails in its intersectionality and I think making very hard lines in the stand. Whereas Bitch Planet comes in and it's like, yep, we we understand the tone that we're going for. We have, we're going to go get a lot of representation in on this. And uh, yeah, here's your line in the sand. You know who your villains are off the bat. And they're the big, they're the big bad money having guys. And your heroines are prisoners because they don't conform to society. They're in prison have to fight to the death simply because they're not like everybody else you know yeah well and i i really i think that the prison narrative sort of took them over on this because it is set in sci-fi and stuff like that sure fine like yeah kind of implausible but at the same time i wasn't ever struck by how ridiculous the setting of it was reading this like it never yeah. once entered to me like oh this is ridiculous and over the top because of I think if it wouldn't have been the prison narrative if it would have just been people interacting with the world like the earth you know but I don't know like it just seemed too real to me like the whole time it just seemed too real to me and I, I mean I don't have any experience in prison life or jail or anything but it brought it to me in a way that I could understand I think maybe the copious use of naked women's bodies and their diversity you know like it wasn't like cookie cutters or anything mm-hmm. it was this diverse look at real life human shapes and i think that probably because they led with that in the intake process of the prison planet like immediately put me in a place where this was very real you know like the the visual clues of the prison experience was what took it away from anything like like with man eaters that kind of felt kind of flippant and over the top and brought it into a place where i was like oh geez (laughs) oh geez and then also like oh i'm so bad you know I mean, Mm -hmm. I first read this, like, God, a very long time ago, but I still feel sort of the embers of my rage whenever I first started reading this when it came out. Oh, yeah. You know? And it's really an interesting thing to look back on, like, almost 10 years later and go, oh, geez, like, (laughs) yep, (laughs) still here. I guess on the note of embers of your rage, like, of course I felt this book makes me mad. It's just a, I don't want to say it's a weird narrative. I think my first emotions reading it were like, yeah, let's fucking go tear down some walls, let's fight the patriarchy, and let's do something. You know, I was mad about the same things I've always been kind of mad about. But what makes me, my response when we're talking about this, is to be very tight-lipped and kind of non-committal about it. And I think that's just kind of training from people who are so uncomfortable with talking about the radical ideas involved, presented in the book, or the the realities presented in the book, you know, the discrimination towards people who are other and is it oh gosh what's the name of the girl is it penelope penelope roll i fucking love her and her entire like backstory in the confrontation with the fathers which is just a terrifyingly creepy narrative the idea of like father knows what's best and it's just this wall of white men <laughs> who are judging her when they're talking about her ideal, like idealized self, and her idealized self is just herself, yeah, yeah, like there's just a lot. Very strong moment. Mm-hmm. But even her willingness to like confront everything and fight it all is amazing. Where it's like, do I feel comfortable talking to people who aren't women about that? And do, would I feel comfortable recommending this book to people? I mean, I probably would just to piss them off, maybe with 
them feeling like it's a little heavy handed and not getting the point of it. Yeah, that's a good point. I fe- I didn't feel like it was heavy handed, but I noticed it. Yeah, it's one of those books I wouldn't give to someone who wasn't already sympathetic. Yeah. Because of the way that it would be dismissed. Like it would it, it is not a book that is like a conveyor to new audiences. One of the interesting things that is in the back matter, there's a, there's a little sign that they have on their uniforms to mark them as non-compliant. It's a little in and a scene. It's a stylized little the stamp. NC. Yeah. And women were getting these tattooed on them on their bodies like almost immediately. Fake tattoos were being sold, but also people were getting them actually tattooed. <laughs> Even within a sympathetic base, there was a negative backlash on that saying like oh, you know, that's only been three issues, blah, 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 like whatever their fucking bullshit argument was. And Ke- and it was like such a big blow up that Kelly Sue actually put it in the back matter. It kind of underlining the reasons why she thought it was bullshit. You know, people who think that they have the idea of the noncompliance, understanding that like, oh, they're marking themselves as noncompliant. That's like some sort of contrarianism or whatever. And it's not. I mean, like she, she went through and she's like, first of all, policing women's bodies is super douchey <laughs> but also yeah. the mark of non-compliance is just that the compliance ideal is bullshit even people who are open to the idea of uh structural racism and and sexism patriarchal misogynistic bullshit <laughs> kind of miss the realness the harshness of this compliance issue intersectionalism has a huge amount to do with this and this is definitely the focus of this book is not female only there are more expressions of issues in america that have that intersectionality to it the idea of a compliant image or whatever is that it hurts even the people who could almost fit in it you know <laughs> like like, yeah. like you were saying that looks uncomfortably close to what i look like but is also just as far away in a lot of ways because it, it's kind of antima to me as a person. And the, the obesity thing, the dealings with body shapes, with submissiveness, with there's a couple of, in that first issue, the new wife sort of going for the throat and trying to get rid of the original wife so she could have this husband. The idea is like some women become compliant and, and they might be hurting themselves to do it. But they are also the villains of the story and they exist. Hashtag not all women are people who are sympathetic to trying to buck this system because they're just close enough that they twist themselves into pretzels well enough to benefit from it. And that is something that is just nuanced enough that I think it's really hard for people who aren't already like of the same mind to pick up from a couple of picture books. Like it's really hard. It's really heavy. Yeah. No, it's. This this book really made made me think in ways I wasn't expecting. It it brought up the same kind of like I don't know existential concerns that I've had, but it wasn't like as fun as Man Eaters, but it did things a lot better than Man Eaters did. <laughs> so it's like kind of hard to pick. Yeah. But talking to you about it, like I feel a bit more uncomfortable. I think you're right. It is harder because the image that I see of myself in this series is the villain. You know what I mean? Like, it is yeah. harder to is harder yeah. deal with this now that I'm older. And I do have a more evolved idea of feminism that now than I did whenever I first read this book. And, like, am I non-compliant? Yes, totally. But I'm not the main receiver of wrongs in yeah. the story as it's being portrayed right now. Like, yeah. It's not me that's being hurt the most. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Kids, it's definitely yeah, one of those, like, I'm, I'm the non-compliant type, but am I that non Compliant. And of course, there is a bit of a delusion of like importance. And I think the reason the reason I might feel that I'm that non-compliant is that I also have people in my life who won't send me to prison. Unlike many of the women in, on Bitch Planet who are like sent by their family, you know. So it's, yeah, like I I don't feel unsafe because I have people in my life who won't ostracize or hurt me because I am non-compliant. But it, as as you already said, that's not always the case. And that's not even still not the case for me if it was a stranger. I mean, you know, like I had a, I still have strangers who never fucking met yeah. me who come up and they're like, how you doing, sweetheart? And I'm like, don't fucking call me sweetheart. Like, I don't fucking know you. I don't know you like that. I don't know you at all. You're going to yeah. come, like, who are you to talk to me like that? So, yeah. I, I mean, there's still probably strangers who throw me under the bus in a heartbeat. 
but I don't have family who's going to do that. So there's a degree of safety that exists you in know, my world that doesn't exist in this world. So it's, it's almost more uncomfortable now than it was whenever this was first released because certain things in the world did happen. <laughs> and yeah. I actually had this conversation. Like we, we've we actually, as a family, had this conversation where it's like, okay, well, the narrative of picking up and moving to Canada wasn't really something that I could I could do, you know, feasibly. I wanted to, but I'm no longer in my early 20s. I have life and commitments and stuff here. Yeah. But, like, it's okay because I'll protect you is something that I actually had a conversation with about the people that I love. And, and that's uncomfortable. The idea that I, I want to be that aspect for other people who are you know, larger targets in the system, the current system, people who are, are more disenfranchised and, you know, like gauging what your comfort is in putting yourself out. I feel like if you want to be an ally, you have to have that conversation with yourself. Um, yeah. Cause I live in a very, I live in a very small town. I live in a very, very white rural area. I don't see a lot of opportunity because there, it is sort of monochrome here to put myself out there and stuff. But if I did, would I? you know, or would I feel comfortable enough? Yeah, and that's kind of, I, I understand what you're saying, because I, I have, I, I see a lot of people online, and I mostly haven't participated in the conversations, because I'm trying to do internal reflection, but reading this, kind of having this conversation now, you know, a lot of people are trying to talk about, like, what does it mean to be white? You know, we always talk about what does it mean to be not white, but there's little conversation on, like, what does it mean to be white? And it kind of having this conversation would mean having to admit the uncertainty of positions, the precariousness of privilege. It would have to admit be admitting fear, discomfort. God, just things that we don't want to. It, it means being fully and entirely vulnerable, which also gets into the white fragility conversation. I do what I can in the moments that I can, but I'll, I also know I'm failing by not showing up to places where I need to be seen. I do try to tell myself that I can dismiss that in other realms because of the professional and even other personal projects and working with other groups that I do, like folks with disabilities. But the fact of the matter is I am not showing up in ways that I could or ways that I should to support people who are at higher risk, who are more vulnerable than I am because I, I have a sense of fear about it because it would also ha have to mean admitting my vulnerability it, not to not say that I don't empathize with it but I, I think I don't know it's just, it's again hard in that conversation you have to have as a as an advocate and even just a willingness to admit it and and here's me admitting it in a recorded scenario uh I do what I can in situations as I'm presented but I don't yeah. show up because I'm scared of the risks involved with that and that is unfair and an entirely privileged stance I could take and makes my skin crawl in the complexity of the yeah yeah this is a conversation I have with my friends a lot and we live in an area where basic human things that you, you would hope were past are not necessarily all past yeah. and so having complex conversations like spectrum-esque conversations about gender or sexuality or you know like race or all of that is very difficult whenever you're fighting a very black and white issue in some ways, you know, like not, not literally, but I mean, like just, it's very dualist still. It's not, it's not evolved enough to be as shaded as some of them were, you know, like I live in a rural area. When I go up into the urban area, I feel a, a distinct disadvantage in conversations about, you know, social justice and um, advocacy because I feel like my advocacy is stunted because of some, like, the conversations I'm having are basic. Like, don't use the N-word, don't use the R-word, don't use the F-word, don't, you know, like, that's not okay. You know what I mean? I mean, like, that's an important that's a, part of the dialogue, too. Of, like, that's a different component of it. still really important to have. Oh, it's just, it's just the feeling of inadequacy of advocacy, you know? Like, it, it feels like, yeah, okay, so I might not come across as you know like doing all that I can but what I'm doing is in its own way very weighted you know because I am in a, in a place that whenever a few of my friends decide to go no that's not right and band together yeah. a little bit against people who are twice our age and dismissive of us as young white women that that feels like a big thing to us you know to me let me just speak for myself it feels very scary to me because these are people that I don't 
want to write me off because they're one of 10 people that I'm around, you know, like I want them to still love and respect me, but I also want them to extend that graciousness to people who aren't like them as much as I am. Totally. And like, I mean, I'm going to say you're on the right path. I, I think the big step for you and I, and a lot of advocates who feel that way is taking that step from simply empathizing and sympathizing to actually action. You know, if I'm experiencing that similar uncertainty and insecurities for potentially similar reasons, I can't sit idly by and let those injustices continue. Like, I have to overcome that at some point, and I have to do something about it. And we've deviated a lot from the plot of Bitch Planet, but those were, I mean, these are the thoughts that I had after reading it, of, like, with all of these people who look like me executing these evils i cannot i can't make those evils anymore even if those evils might look like just sitting around and not saying something like i have to start saying something but as long as you keep doing the actions that's that's all you got to do is fight against the people who who are being hateful and i might not experience it and i don't know what it's like to be of those groups but it's happening to them (laughs) <laughs> like and that shouldn't be and that's that's the core of it and so just holding on to that is really important i think that we would have been wrong to skim over our stance of privilege in this it would have been a disservice to the conversation i want open feedback if people have statements to say please let us know we've got a yeah. facebook just so we can grow ourselves and continue to make actions and kind of support people in the best way we can. But thank you for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Holy shit. Maybe people will listen to this. <laughs>